Welcome to Radio on Fire, home of the Diamond K Show. Diamond K in the house. And now for your urban news and entertainment report. Here's your host, Diamond K. Oh my goodness. It's the Diamond K Show. Most people think that U.S. crime, the U.S. crime rate is rising. They're wrong, though. But 80% of Americans and about 92% of Republicans think that crime has gone up. It actually fell in 2023. Now, um, the familiar culprit for this mistaken impression that a lot of Americans have is actually simple. It's actually simple to get to the reason why. So as I said, crime in the United States has declined significantly over the last year. FBI data contradicts this widespread perception that lawbreaking and violence is on the rise. Because when you see it on the news, when we see it on social media, they only highlight certain things. A Gallup poll released last month found that 77% of Americans think that crime is on the rise. 77% think this, but they are mistaken. FBI data and other statistics prove that. The FBI data that I am talking about, which compares crime rates in the third quarter of 2023 to the same period in 2022, found that violent crime has dropped 8%, while property crime fell 6.3%, to what would be the lowest level since, get this, 1961. 1961. So you mean to tell me that property crime has fallen, violent crime has dropped? Why is this not national news? Why is this not being reported? Murder in the United States in 2023 plummeted to one of the fastest rates of decline ever recorded. Every category of major crime, except for auto theft, is down. This is not the story that you're seeing in mainstream media. This is not the story that they want to tell. But this is the truth. So hit Radio on Fire. You may Don McKay, I have got to give you these facts. 92% of Republicans, 78% of independents, and 57% of Democrats think that crime is rising, according to surveys. What are the drivers of crime? We talk about this all the time. The drivers of crime. The economy is actually in a good place. That is not what Republicans want you to believe. That is not what Republicans want you to believe. People have been conditioned, and uh, it's difficult to, to counter this idea, this thought that crime is rising. It's just an overwhelming number of news stories, viral videos of people smashing and grabbing and um, things like that. Social media plays a big role in this, but uh, mainstream media as well plays a big role in this. But as I said, according to annual reports covering 94% of the country and violent crime I mean, violent crime in 20, 
22 fell back to pre-pandemic levels with murder dropping over 6%. So when you look at some of these big cities, big, what what they call the Democrat-controlled cities, you know, whatever, um, murder down 12%. Now, there was a rise during the pandemic because, as I said, crime is driven by the economy. Detroit. My father was born in Detroit. Detroit is on pace to have the fewest murders since well before I was born. Detroit is on pace to have the fewest murders since 1966. Now, Baltimore, my town, St. Louis, all on track to post the fewest murders that each of these cities have seen in nearly a decade. I'm sure that uh, Mayor Brandon Scott, who is running for re-election, is going to try to tout some of these numbers, try to tout some of these statistics in his re-election bid later on this year. Now, Memphis and D.C. are still seeing increases in their murder rate, but they are outliers They are exceptions to the trend. Exceptions to the trend. Crime in the U.S. is down. So why don't social media and mainstream media stories reflect that? Retail theft, widely believed to have skyrocketed in some cities. And the industry says that it is at unprecedented levels. Now, the data does not necessarily support this. FBI data does not have a separate category for retail theft. It falls under larceny. Now, larceny declined overall last year, according to these numbers. FBI numbers are not the only measure of crime, though. The annual Justice Department survey of criminal victimization in 2022 found that a lot of crime goes unreported. More people reported being victims of a violent crime in 2022 than in 2021. So there are a lot of factors In this, why are Americans' perceptions about crime so different from the apparent reality? Why? Now, there is partisanship at work. Republicans are more ready to believe that crime is increasing, while Democrats hold the White House. Now, Media consumption is a big part of this. Media consumption. You have this thought process. You have social media viral videos. Videos of flash mobs on shoplifting sprees or carjackings in broad daylight. You're seeing that. The videos are being passed around on social media. We see that there is a natural tendency for the news media, for the news media to highlight disturbing crime stories. They used to say in the newspaper industry, if it bleeds, it leads. They want to push these type of stories to the forefront. But I want to continue to remind people the 80% of Americans, the almost 80% of Americans, the 92% of Republicans that think that crime is up, you are wrong. It has fallen. Now, it is still higher than it needs to be. It is higher than we want it to be. 
But like a student who's trying to bring their grades up but has not necessarily brought it up to an A, when they get a B, give them some credit, fam. Give them some credit. Of course, you listen to the Dominic K Show, of course, RadioOnFire.tv. I am here weekdays, 7 p.m. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. I love to hear from you. DJ Diamond K at gmail.com. Of course, on all social media, I am at the Diamond K Show. Now, uh, I I want people to understand that when I say the crime is down, and it is, I'm not saying that we have reached the point where we need to be. Not saying that at all. I am just saying that when we talk about something as important as crime, when we talk about something as serious as that, we have got to tell the actual story. We have got to let people know what is really, as they say, going on. Now, we have a voicemail number here at the Diamond K Show. You can always leave me a message. We'll get to it. Sometimes I'll play them on the show. 443-492-9442 is our number. Uh, definitely leave me a message. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, we're going to listen to all the messages and definitely uh, play some of those good ones on the show. Don't forget the best way to support what we do here at Radio on Fire is to become a member. It gives you access to the daily bonus show from yours truly, Don McKay, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive dating back to 2007 and plenty of other awesome perks like the On Fire Mix Show. You get bonus mixes, all of that. Go to joindiamondk.com. That is joindiamondk.com to get started and continue to help push this independent machine. So this has been, I don't know, a long time coming because her getting this job as president of Harvard University, it ruffled some feathers. It ruffled some feathers when it happened. Claudine Gay, smart lady. However, sometimes folks are smart, but they forget to be wise. Claudine Gay has resigned as Harvard University's president. This, of course comes after allegations of plagiarism and criticism over her comments about what happens on the campus of Harvard University. Anti-Semitism is at the forefront, comments of of, uh, what's allowed, what's not allowed. She had been facing this mounting pressure to step down in recent weeks. I think that she should not have buckled to the pressure, but she did. Now, in a letter announcing her resignation, she said that it was in the best interest of the university for her to go. There has been a lot of pressure put on her. It has been distressing to have doubt cast on my commitments to confronting hate and to upholding Scholarly rigor, she said. Now, this, this is what I'm talking about. Smart people that forget to be wise. She was in a congressional hearing. And she answered questions, moral questions. Like, like an attorney. This could only spell trouble. She wasn't the only one, though. She said that this decision did not come easy. She said that it had been difficult beyond words. 
She wrote that adding that her resignation would allow Harvard to focus on the institution rather than any individual. Now, ironically, I'm sure that they probably prepared her for that testimony. She said that she had been subjected to personal threats and racial animus. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that at all. The exit of Harvard's leader plays into some very bitter campus wars that are going on right now. The 53-year-old served as president for only six months. She was the first black person and the second woman to be appointed to lead the Ivy League University. Her tenure was the shortest in its 388-year history. Now, race plays a part in this. Now, some, some of y'all are not going to want to hear that. Some of y'all are going are gonna to complain about it. Uh, but it is it is true. It is true. Harvard is one of several universities in this country accused of failing to protect its Jewish students following the uh, attack, the the outbreak of the Israel Hamas war in the fall of last year. So we had that come about. Jewish groups have reported an alarming rise in anti-Semitic incidents in this country since that conflict began. Uh, there was a very tense congressional hearing last month. Dr. Gay said that calls for the killing of Jews was abhorrent. She said, however, that it would depend on the context whether such comments would constitute a violation of Harvard's code of conduct regarding bullying and harassment. And this is when she gave folks the ammunition that they needed to get her up out of there. This this type of talk. She fell into a trap, if you will. So this comment prompted a, a whole lot of backlash she later apologized in an interview with the university's student newspaper, but she should have got ahead of this. She should have been prepared for this. This was an easy layup, and all of these so-called smart people failed to do it. Failed to do it. Dozens of politicians and some high-profile alumni called for her to step down over these comments. So the day after these congressional hearings, I was getting a tattoo and I heard the, the hearings, they were being played ironically in the tattoo shop. And, you know, when I heard the testimony from these so-called smart people, these educators, I said, Dan, that was dumb. That was dumb. Nearly 700 staff members rallied behind her in a letter, and the university said that she would keep her job despite the controversy. They prepared her for this, and uh, she had to take the fall, fell on the sword, if you will. U.S. media outlets have unearthed instances, several of them, where there was alleged plagiarism in her academic record. Some recent, something from back in the day, Harvard's board investigated these allegations last month, and they found that uh, two published papers required some additional citations. She didn't credit a couple people on two papers, like I said, but they said that she did not violate the standards uh, of misconduct. Um, uh, she failed to properly cite some academic sources, and that emerged just hours before she resigned uh, the paper. Uh, they were published anonymously um, and the uh, Washington free beacon uh, that these claims, I mean, so, you know, 
she's she's gone. The university's uh, eleven member governing body, the Harvard Corpor- uh, Corporation, said in a statement that Dr. Gay would resume her faculty position after resigning. So she's still going to work there, but she's not going to be the uh, president anymore. And um, I think that that really highlights the fact that she was put in this position with regards to the congressional hearing. And they knew what she was going to say. They approved of it. But the backlash, the backlash has been too much. And it's just ironic that uh, Dr. Gay, who is the second university official to resign following the uh, December 5th congressional hearing, these so-called smart people get these easy layups wrong. This is an easy layup. It's an easy layup. The problem at Harvard or any of these other institutions is much larger than one leader. It's much larger than one leader. This was a Republican-led committee. It launched this probe into Harvard and other universities and said that the investigation would continue. This is what you call red meat for the base. Red meat for the base. This is something that Republicans will hang their, hat, their hats on, I guess. Here's what's ironic. Uh, Republicans are very worried about this. But in the meantime, in the meanwhile, in a couple of weeks, the country could shut down. The government could shut down. They're not worried about rushing about that. They are focused on what's happening on these college campuses and, and these are hypothetical things. And, and you know, um, uh, many Jewish people around the country are concerned. And so uh, these hearings were worthy. Uh, but I want to see the same level of intensity towards getting some of these things worked out so that the government does not shut down. We're going to talk about the government shutdown and uh, the the pending uh, problem that could bring up. Don't forget, the best way to support what we do here at Radio on Fire is to become a member that gives you access to the daily bonus show from yours truly, Dami K, uh, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive dating back to 2007. Wow, it's been a long time. Plenty of other awesome perks like uh, the On Fire Mix show. You get bonus episodes of that. Go to joindiamondk.com. That is joindiamondk.com to support what we do here. Welcome back to the show. You made Dami K in here. So in and out Burger has been ranked as the second healthiest cheeseburger in the country. Kind of interesting. Uh, it's an interesting survey uh, that was done. Interesting analysis, shall I say. And uh, gambling.com decided to analyze the healthiest fast food hamburgers in the country after American Heart Month raised awareness for the fight against cardiovascular disease. So the the, uh, analysis looks at sugar, fat, salt, and uh, calorie content listed at Fat Secret and My Net. Uh, so, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about this, these these burgers, this analysis, and, and what they came up with. Uh, as I said, it, it's a very interesting um, thing that they did to look at this, and, and I, th- I think it's cool. So, number 10 was Wendy's. Now, Wendy's got a 4.6. 
health score. Number nine is five guys with a 4.8 health score. McDonald's, a 5.0 health score. Number eight for McDonald's. Number seven, Carl's Jr., which is Hardy's as well, uh, also with a 5.0 health score, and that's at number seven. Number six, Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen has a 5.2 health score. Number five, Del Tacos, Del Cheeseburger. They have a health score of 5.5, and they are number five on this list of the healthiest fast food hamburgers in America. Number four, uh, Culver's Butter Burger. They have a 5.7 health score. It's number four. And number three is Checkers slash Rallies. They have a 6.3 health score. They're at number three. Uh, We talked about number two, which is In-N-Out Burger with the 8.2 health score. And what they said is the healthiest fast food hamburger in America is a Whataburger with cheese. They have an 8.4 health score. I've had a a, a water burger uh, with cheese before. It was very good. I'm not going to I'm not going to front. Uh I have not had an in and out burger before. Uh but uh Checkers Rallies I've had that burger. Culver's never had that. Del Taco never had that. Uh Dairy Queen I've had their burger. Hardee's had that. Of course McDonald's, Five Guys, Wendy's I've had those. So it's an interesting list. Uh I definitely would like uh, I, I probably need to try some of these other burgers just to, just to make sure that these folks know what they're talking about. Um, and, and, and so this is a this is an interesting interesting job that they had to do. Uh, could could you know I, I could easily chip in here if they need some help. But it, it's interesting uh, to to look at this and analyze this, and I think that it is so important to know this kind of stuff. Like this is. This is uh, important stuff, and you and, and you want to know what the uh, health is of different foods. So there's this picture floating around. Not sure if you've seen it, uh, but Jada Pinkett, you know, she's going viral for this look. Uh, it's it's a selfie that she took. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's Jada. <laughs> I mean, so uh, she's got. She she's got the whole. She looked like a just on a quick glance looks almost like a skinny version of uh, Fat Joe to me. Uh, kind of weird, uh, but you know it uh, it is what it is, and she is she is feeling herself. Uh, so you know, shout shout out to uh, to uh, Jada uh, on that. She I don't know. She just can't catch a break. She she just she just can't catch a break. Um, this story here, they always talk about this, uh, this time of year when the clock strikes midnight on, uh, on New Year's Eve and it, and it goes to another year. They, they want to know who is the, the first baby born, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and some people celebrate with champagne coming into the new year. Uh, others welcome their first babies into the uh, 2024 Right. So at uh, Yale New Haven Hospital, some twins born, Soli Morris and Seven Morris, were born three minutes apart with uh, Soli arriving at 12.02 a.m. and Seven at 11.59 p.m. So needless to say, these twins born minutes apart are actually born in separate years. <laughs> that is, uh, I just think that that is so interesting. That is like super cool to have something like that uh, happen. So, uh, so these twins are actually born in different years. Wow. Uh, also, you know, just talking about some uh, some things that are maddening. Some daycare workers. Busted for allegedly running a child fighting ring. 
You heard me correctly. In South Carolina, two child care providers were taken into custody for allegedly running a child fighting ring. Can you imagine dropping your kids off and picking them up and it's nicks and scratches, it's cuts, it's bumps, it's bruises on your child. And you're thinking, I mean, you know, what is going on? Kids, kids doing normal stuff that kids do. Uh, well, Serena Caldwell, 56 years old, and Erica Jones, 27 years old, were charged with inciting at least, check this out, 14 children to fight at Kids Unlimited in South Carolina. How angry would you be at these ladies, right? Here's the thing. These ladies are being paid. These ladies are being paid, and they are fighting your kids. Unbelievable. I'm sure that uh, many folks were upset about this, and uh, I I definitely uh, cannot, um, you know, I don't fault them for that. These daycare workers encouraging toddlers to fight, encouraging that. So deputies uh, discovered the children were actually instructed by the suspects to shove, pull, and hit other children. So, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's really unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. So they have been arrested, these ladies, both employees have been fired from their jobs. So this is not something that uh, the office, the uh, management co-signed. They, they, they're saying we didn't co-sign none of this. Uh, but they have been fired. They turned themselves in on these multiple charges. And, and they should be arrested. This is, uh, this is out of control. This is, this is out of control. So the allegations of Child abuse and neglect happened at Kids Unlimited of Prosperity, where these ladies used to work. Sheriff Lee Foster said that the daycare reported the issue to law enforcement and has been fully cooperating. Um, I I just have no idea what these two ladies were thinking. It it is it is uh, behavior that is. Abhorrent. I can't imagine why they would do this. Can't imagine that. Uh, But as I said, these claims involve a 27-year-old Erica Jones and 56-year-old Serena Caldwell. Uh, So they have been court, bond hearing, facing multiple counts, including contributing to the delinquency of a minor and unlawful conduct towards a child. Uh, 14 children involved now ages three and four years old three and four years old um yeah it it is uh parents of one of the victims who did not want to be identified spoke in court saying that their child was instructed to hit another child after he did he was instructed to do it again Uh, Foster said, and this is the sheriff, that uh, while there is no serious physical injuries to the children, harm has been done. I I believe that uh, harm has been done. uh, But thankfully, no serious injury uh, has, uh, you know, was inflicted to the children, which is probably why they were able to uh, get away with this for a time. No, no serious injuries. Uh, But, you know, you don't know what impact this had on the children um, uh, internally, emotionally. Yeah, you, you just don't know. Uh, so these these uh, ladies, I mean, I, I don't know if they should go away for the rest of their life or anything like that, uh, but uh, definitely uh, something needs to be done and something will be done. This is an interesting story here. James Harrison known as the man with the golden arm. He donated his uh, special blood 
every single week for, get this, 64 years. This man donated blood every week for 64 years. Uh, and according to the Australian Red Cross Blood Service, uh, his actions have directly saved the lives of more than 2.4 million babies who were in need of blood. Now, Harris, Harrison's blood is unique. It has disease-fighting antibodies that have been used to develop injection and this injection is called the anti-D, which helps fight against uh, disease. Uh, his remarkable gift has saved lives of, of so many. And, um, you know, many people are, are actually inspired. Uh, so what got him, I guess, into this is that uh, he had his own life saved during a chest surgery in which he required a blood donation. And that, you know, um, touched him in such a way that he wanted to, to, uh, to do the same for others. And, uh, and that's, a, that's, that's an amazing story there. Every day for 64 years, could you do that? I mean, I guess you could if you were, uh, if, if you were touched in that way. Uh, you know, you, you got to be motivated. And, and it appears that uh, this gentleman was motivated. Of course, on all social media, I'm at the Diamond K Show. Need to get in touch with me, DJ Diamond K at gmail.com, radio on fire.tv. So, this Uber driver, this Uber driver returned $8,000 that a teen passenger lost in his car. So, returned $8,000. So uh, Espan Camu has been an Uber driver for years and recently had this teenager who left a large sum of cash in his car during the ride. The teenager uh, mentioned to the driver that his dad had given him the cash as a Christmas present to buy himself a motorcycle. I mean, this is he's having this conversation with this. This is so... Uh, uh, I, I guess it's just a different time. <laughs> so after the trip is completed, they both realize the cash was left in the car and uh, uh, reported the uh, missing item on the app. Uber connected them over the phone. Uh, the driver returned the money back to the teenager uh, without hesitation. Uh, the Uber driver says that when you do something good, it comes back 10 times. Um. And so, you know, that is true. When you do something good, good comes back to you. Could you have returned that money? Would you have? I hope. I hope that you would have returned that money. Um, if, uh, you know, if that happened to you, I, I hope that you would uh, have returned that. So since we're talking about, uh, you know, drivers, a delivery driver who won $4.8 in the lottery still worked his Christmas shift. Still worked this Christmas shift, uh, but this supermarket delivery driver who won almost $5 million, who won $4.8 million, uh, which definitely made him rich enough to quit. But on December 23rd of uh, 2023, he had his delivery shift at the same time. Um, his partner said that they both intended to keep working uh, to remain grounded. So almost $5 million and said, you know what? I'm still going to continue to work regardless of all of this. And this uh, uh, happened over the Christmas holiday. Um, and, and another thing that happened on the Christmas holiday, not sure if you saw this, this young, young boy was going around to different apartments in his apartment complex, knocking on their doors, you know, ringing the bell and all that to wish the neighbors a Merry Christmas. And he was doing this to help himself feel better since the passing of his mother. Uh, just a, a, uh, a heartbreaking thing, you know. Uh, so definitely praying for uh, this young man. And, uh, you know, so this is, 
The holidays were on the other side of it, but it is still a tough time for a lot of folks. Tough time. Tough time. Uh, now, going uh, a little north of the border for a moment, free tampons and menstrual pads are now required to be stocked in men's rooms in Canada following some new regulations. So in, in, in what I hope does not come here, the uh, federally regulated employers, including federal public service departments, banks, airports, and train stations, must provide free menstrual products in all employee bathrooms. Uh, Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, uh, uh, announced this. His administration is requiring all federally regulated employers in Canada to provide these menstrual products in all bathrooms to accommodate transgender employees. So uh, the change to Canada's labor code was announced in the spring of 2023, but it went into effect last month and uh, specified, it specified that Menstrual products must be in all toilet rooms, regardless of their marked gender. This means that every female identified, male identified, and all gender toilet rooms will need to have menstrual products. Canada's Employment and Social Department website said workplace bathrooms must have a uh, covered uh, disposable container in every toilet. Um, do you think that the U.S. should follow suit? No, I do not. Uh, but if you think that the U.S. should do this as well, I would love to hear from you. Tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, DJ Diamond K at gmail.com on all social media. I am at the Diamond K Show. Of course, we have a voicemail number, 443 443- Four nine two nine four four two. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if you feel that. We, if you if you think I got this wrong, I, I just I don't understand. Nor do I uh, think that this is something that that we need to be getting into. Uh, I just I I some you know, sometimes we can take things too far. Sometimes we can take things too far, and. I think this is this is one of those instances uh, in uh, New York. A teacher says that he was fired from a Catholic school for being gay. Of course, the school refutes these claims. But this teacher says that he was fired from his job at a Catholic elementary school in New York due to his sexual orientation. And now students and parents are rallying to bring him back now. I don't think that anyone should be fired for something like that. I don't. Uh, and as I said, the school is is uh, refuting these claims. Uh, no one should be fired for that reason. But uh, Michael um, Califano uh, said that he was a third grade teacher at uh, M- Maria Regina School in uh, Seaford, New York. He said that he believes he lost his job because school officials found out about his sexual orientation. And he was fired, according to him, for that reason. So that that is that is illegal, I'm sure. Uh, and in the, in the state of New York, uh, I'm sure that that would be illegal. Students and parents are trying to get him back in, in school. He felt that the values he learned in Catholic school were ingrained in him, and he wanted to share that with the next generation and to be told that uh, one's, uh, that's one of the reasons why he was let go, he says, is hurtful to his heart said that he is a gay man and said that photos of him kissing his boyfriend on Instagram were sent to officials at school. 
uh, the school's administrators then allegedly told Califano that he had violated handbook policy of adhering to Catholic values, which he denied doing, and that they would let him go, is uh, what was said. So if, if, if he violated the Catholic values, that is what they are, um, uh, I guess that is the point of contention. They called him in, laid it out, and uh, that was the end of it. He said, uh, "Yeah, so that is uh, that is that is interesting." Um, the diocese of Rockville Center, which runs the school, uh, did not immediately respond for comment. Um, however, the uh, diocese did refute Califano's claims in a statement to uh, WABC TV and. News 12 in Long Island. They said that for privacy reasons, we do not comment publicly on personnel matters, but we can say that the school did not end Mr. Califano's employment over his sexuality. So clearly they have found another reason to get rid of him. Uh, maybe it was something that he said to a student, uh, something else. Uh, a rally was had, held on Friday by school parents and students requesting that Califano uh, be reinstated into his teaching position. Uh, he wants his job back. Uh, however, I just, I don't know. I don't see that happening. Uh, the way that the uh, uh, school is answering this kind of tells me that this is not going, you know, like they're not going to buckle to this pressure. They are not feeling uh, this at all. They, they are they are not feeling this at all, uh, and um, and and I think that that is going to be that. Uh, I mean, what's he going to do? I mean, just you know, what what is what is he going to do? I don't I, I don't see this going his way. So, last thing I wanted to talk about: this woman went viral for taking some holiday pictures with her baby father's other BM. Did you, did you see these? Now, so so she's showing her her maturity. Um, now, a lot of people had a lot to say about it, and I, and I thought it was so interesting uh, because here's the thing: uh, the ladies are dressed alike, and you know the kids, you know, so ladies are wearing white shirts and uh, blue jeans. Uh, the kids are wearing black, and uh, the four of them are all together. The guy's not in the shot. Um, but uh, they are extended family. And, and we're so used to hearing the kids' mothers feuding. Uh, but these ladies are mature, uh, extended family taking holiday pictures. Nothing more, nothing less. I, I, didn't, I didn't see it uh, as being such a crazy thing. Uh, but a lot of folks had a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, one thing, I, like I said, I did notice he's not in the picture. They left him out. Maybe he took the picture. I didn't think about that. Um, but uh, I, I think it's mature. Uh, some folks thought it was weird, though. Some some uh, some folks said that they're they're sister wives at this point. Uh, but for these women like this, maybe maybe he's still smashing both of them. Maybe, maybe you know that's I guess that's possible. It's possible that he's still smashing uh, both of them. Uh, I, I thought it was cool, though, because here's the thing. These kids are siblings, right? And, and it's about the children. They're definitely going to have they're definitely gonna have memories. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I don't know. It is uh, it, it's definitely adulthood. I, I'm glad to see it. I'm glad that the ladies are not feud, right? It is a good look for their kids for the future. Um, you know, it, it's definitely some interesting memories there. Uh, and healthy relationships, super important, super important. So um, I am happy about this for this family, especially the kids, uh, the mothers seemingly in a good place. And it is, it is great that they all get along. Because, like I said, there's so many stories. We talk about it all the time, stories where kids' mothers are feuding. 
And um, this is the type of things that we need to see. I'm glad that it went viral because we need to see more things like this. We need to see more things, more things like this and, and teaching the right messages for the next generation. So these two ladies um, that have kids by the same guy uh, taking holiday photos together. Wow. That, that, that's real cool. Um, that, that, that is real cool. Uh, last story before we get out of here, this Ohio couple, uh, this was so crazy. This Ohio couple has the same birthday, right? So that right there is already uh, uh, stressful. <laughs> and then they give birth to twins on their birthday. Whole family has the same birthday. I don't know if I would like that. I mean, you talk about dad getting the uh, uh, short end of the stick. The father's going to get the short end of the stick every birthday, every birthday. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's definitely uh, good news that they have uh, healthy kids and all of that. But the same birthday, and same birthday as wife, everybody, same, er, everybody, you get a birthday, you get a birthday, you get a birthday, uh, all their birthdays on uh, the same day. Of course, the Diamond K Show on fire. Uh, dash TV, radio on fire dot TV, uh, all social media at the Diamond K show. Of course, youtube.com slash DJ Diamond K. Don't forget the best way to support what we do here at Radio on Fire is to become a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show from yours truly, the regular show with no commercials, and you also get access to our entire catalog, which dates back to 2007. That's how long we've been doing the Diamond K show. Also, some other awesome perks like the On Fire Mix show. You also get bonus mixes. Go to joindiamondk.com. That is joindiamondk.com to uh, support the movement and uh, and all that is going on here. We have so many things planned uh, for 2024. In addition. Uh, to the fact that this is an election year. The presidential election uh, is fast approaching. We are uh, in that that primary season. Uh, Donald Trump has asked the U.S. Supreme Court to overturn Colorado's ruling, which uh, was barring him from being on the ballot. And this is because of the January 6th attack. Uh, the anniversary for that is uh, going to happen over the weekend, uh, ironically. Uh, but the former president said last week, and he, he asked the Supreme Court, uh, we knew this was coming, right? But, but he asked the Supreme Court to overturn the ruling which banned him from being on this ballot. This is setting up a high-stakes showdown over whether a constitutional provision prohibiting those who engaged in insurrection uh, to end his uh, political career. Because if he is banned in Colorado, there are going to be other states that are going to do it. And while Colorado alone is not going to prohibit him uh, from becoming president if he's the nominee, if a lot of other states do it because he engaged in insurrection, uh, then uh, it is, uh, I don't know, it, it would be over. It would be over for the Donald. He would be in, uh, in, in big trouble. Uh, Trump appealed this 4-3 ruling in December by the Colorado Supreme Court that marked the first time in history that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was used to bar a presidential contender from the ballot. Now, the court found that Trump's role in the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol disqualified him under that clause. So uh, the provision has been used very, very sparingly in American history. Uh, it's been used so sparingly that the Supreme Court actually never ruled on it. I know that they don't want to touch this, uh, but we have a conservative leaning court, the Supreme Court. Uh, six three majority, so they're gonna try to find a way. They don't want to touch it. 
but they have to. Uh, I don't, I don't see how they're going to be able to get out of this. Uh, today's development came a day after Trump's legal team filed, uh, a appeal, uh, against this ruling by Maine's Democratic Secretary of State. Uh, and she said that Trump was ineligible to appear on that state's ballot over his role in the Capitol attack. So as you can see, they're coming out and uh, both the Colorado Supreme Court and the main secretary of state's rulings are on hold until these appeals play out. Uh, depending on the state, it would be the Supreme Court of that state that makes the ruling or the Secretary of State, it just depends. States' uh, rules differ. Um, now, Trump's critics have filed dozens of lawsuits seeking to disqualify him in multiple states. So he lost Colorado by 13 points in 2020. He does not need to win that state to gain either the Republican presidential nomination or the presidency. But as I said, the Colorado ruling has the potential to prompt courts or secretaries of state uh, to remove him from the ballots in other must-win states. So this is going to be very interesting. This, this is going to be interesting. Uh, and uh, this new appeal that Trump has uh, laid out to the Supreme Court also follows the one from Colorado's Republican Party. So they're trying to, to help out in that. Um, I expect the high court will take the case because it concerns unsettled constitutional issues that go to the heart of the way the country is governed. Uh, normally, they would try to find a way to kick this back down. I just don't see how they're going to be able to do it. They're going to have to take this up. Now, all of the parties to the case have urged the court to move quickly. Trump's lawyers said today um, that uh, they hope that the court overturns the ruling without even hearing the argument. Um, I think that they need to hear this argument. I'm hoping that they do. Attorneys representing Colorado's plaintiffs have urged oral arguments, but also seek uh, a very quick schedule. They want this accelerated. They're trying to call for a resolution by next month. Colorado's primary is March the 5th. They are taking this down to the wire. To the wire. We have a primary coming up on Super Tuesday. We need answers. We uh, we definitely need answers. This is going to be interesting. Uh, so we talk about Section 3. Most people don't even think about this, but... Um, it is uh, it's something that dates back to the Civil War. That, that's where it originated. Now, uh, it kept defeated Confederates from returning to their former government positions. Now, um, the clause is only two sentences long, and it says that anyone who swore an oath to support the Constitution and then engaged in insurrection cannot hold office unless a two-thirds vote of Congress allows it. Uh, and, and so it, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, um, its only application in the 20th century was being cited by Congress in 1919 to block the seating of a socialist who opposed the U.S. involvement in World War I and was elected to the House of Representatives. That's the only time uh, in recent times that it has been used. Uh, in 2022, a judge used it to remove a uh, New Mexico county commissioner from office after he was convicted of a misdemeanor for entering the U.S. Capitol on January the 6th. So it was used at that time. Uh, liberal groups sued to uh, block a Republican and uh, 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 Madison Carthorn and Marjorie Taylor Greene from running for re-election because of their roles on January 6th. Carthorn's uh, case became moot when he lost in his election and uh, judge ruled to keep Marjorie Taylor Greene on the ballot. So uh, there's a lot going on there. The Biden administration um, 
has uh, noted that the president has no role in this litigation. Uh, so the court intends to hear the appeal, I'm sure. Uh, but there, there's, there's a lot that's going on with that. So we're going to ha- definitely follow that and report on it as it happens. As I said, the Diamond K Show, 6 p.m. right here. Uh, anywhere you get your podcast, just search the Diamond K Show. And I will be back here tomorrow, radioonfire.tv, youtube.com slash DJ Diamond K. Anywhere you get social media uh, posts, just check out at the Diamond K Show. And uh, I am right there. As I said, don't forget the best way to support what we do here at Radio on Fire is to become a member. It gives you access to the daily bonus show from yours truly, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire catalog dating back to 2007. Yes, been in the game that long. Uh, And also some other awesome perks like the On Fire Mix Show bonus mixes. Join DiamondK.com. Join DiamondK.com. I will see you guys tomorrow.